Hello, brothers and sisters, and uh, this is a good uh, opportunity to be with you here. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, God, and thank you uh, for your uh, support, Ukraine, pray about Ukraine. Uh, I'm here, want to share a couple things about me, about my family, and about my ministry. So um, my name is Slavik. Uh, my full name is Yaroslav, but everyone's called me Slavik. And um, I have a beautiful wife and four children, especially uh, uh, last one, uh, Emmanuel, was born on the first day of the war. So uh, this is my family. Uh, this is my wife, uh, Slavik, Daniel, Tamila, and Emmanuel. And uh, yes, um, they are big support for me, for my ministry. I am the pastor of church, uh, my church called Journey Church. I am the pastor of Journey Church. Uh, we uh, started this church uh, two weeks, two years ago, and now we have 57 members of this church, and uh, church grow up, so uh, we have a good opportunity to share the gospel in Lviv, because Lviv is a big city, one million people in this city, and we have... Uh, not much uh, Baptist churches in this city. So um, this is my ministry in church. I'm also a teacher and uh, in seminary. I'm director of um, Young Leaders Program and Seminary, and I'm director of a Christian Counseling Program in this seminary. So we try to prepare new leaders for Ukrainian churches. Because of the war, we lose many, many leaders. They are can left, they just left from Ukraine, moved to another country, and uh, now we need to new leaders for the churches. Many churches is closed now because of war, and many leaders move to another country. So we try to prepare new leaders for churches, new pastors, new church planters. So, uh, and God bless us. We have many, many students. And last year we have record number of students. So we expect this, this number of this year. So, uh, uh, and I'm also work with, with refugees. My, uh, one of the main, my uh, ministry is to work with refugees. Because you know, because of the war, we have many, many refugees. I'm living in the West Ukraine, and many people from East Ukraine come into the West Ukraine because they uh, try to find some safe place. Our uh, region is not so safe, but more safety than East Ukraine. And we have a couple million people, and we try to serve them for uh, the food, uh, medicine, uh, counseling, spiritual health, and uh, um, yeah, this is a picture from uh, our ministry. Especially we do special trips. Uh, we do a trips from West Ukraine to the East Ukraine because in uh, to close to front line, 10 miles, uh, 15 miles, five miles, many, many people still live there and with their families and children live there. So we try to make a special uh, trips there and uh, we make a camps for children. We spend time with people. And you know, uh, many people there, that are uh, looking for hope. And we try to give them hope. We try to work with them. We try to share the gospel. We try to share the uh, God's law with these people. So this is a picture from a couple of miles from uh, uh, front line. And like you see, many people live there. Uh, so, um, one of the, our uh, ministry, we try to open it special centers. We call them weaker centers. We open it these weaker centers of biggest city in Ukraine. Now we have uh, 16 centers. And the refugees can just come to the center, uh, get some food, some uh, medicine, some uh, another things, and uh, have a spiritual help counseling help. Uh, so um, 16 centers we have now, and uh, almost uh, 20,000 people come into the centers every month. So this is our ministry now. And uh, we, try, we try to s s serve people 
and uh, the occupied territory. The territory who was the occupied Russian soldiers, but now they're free this territory. And we try to serve these people because, you know, many, many people, uh, uh, especially in this territory, they are need some help because uh, they don't have a job, they don't have a, uh, anyone. So we try to serve them. And um, next, please, uh, into this our trip. Next, please. Uh, I have a little bit of story about this woman. She was uh, 62 or 65 years old. And uh, this picture was uh, in Poland. Because three, three um, weeks after war started, we moved to Poland with my family to serve people there. And this woman was from uh, Donetsk region. This is close to the front line, and she came to the Poland, and she had some pain here. And and doc, and we he asked me and my brother in this picture, can we get uh, can we come in with her to hospital? And we do this. We help her, and doctor says you have a cancer. So uh, she was in uh, uh, shocked and stress, and we tried to support her. We try to be with her. We try to spend time with her. We try to sh share the gospel. Uh, after operation, she feels good and uh, she repent. She baptized, and a uh, couple months ago, uh, the, she uh, this cancer was come back. And doctor says you have only a couple months. But before she die, she write a message on Facebook page. And she write the next one. I'm never was, I never been happy like this in my life. I never was happy like this in my life because I know Jesus. And she died with Jesus and she died like a happy woman. So uh, we understand that uh, God's make a miracles, many miracles uh, during the war. Especially during the war, because war is so terrible, war is so bad, but God do many, many good things. Uh, next pictures, please. Um, like I say, ma many, many people have many, many needs, especially in the occupied territory, because Russian soldiers stolen everything, and uh, we we bought. Uh, a car wash machine for one family who have 11 children and don't have a wash machine because Russian soldiers stolen. And uh, we try to support people like, like this way. So this is our ministry. We try to help refugees. We try to help people who doesn't have a home. Uh, we have one pastor who uh, live a couple miles from front line. And um, Russian missiles fall down on his house and now and destroy it. And now he live on the tent outside. And I ask him, why do you not come into like West Ukraine? Because it's more safety. And he said, you know, I don't need it. Because I need God's call, call me to be here. I need to be here because many, many people here need to uh, hear the gospel. So... Um, Churches on the East Ukraine is full because people looking for hope and uh, coming to the church. So please pray about our ministry. It's really important ministry for uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians. And you know, uh, we have a war now. It's, it's so terrible, but um, all Ukrainians still believe in victory. Yeah, this, this sounds like, like a miracle. Yeah, but God is... Uh, but can, God can do this, this miracle. So please pray about, about Ukraine. Pray about our ministry, about refugees. And pray about victory for Ukraine. Because we believe that God can do this. And we hope, our hope is in God. So thank you for your support. Us. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, please continue to do this. We appreciate it. May God bless you. Thank you.
I'm grateful to the Lord that we have this opportunity to uh, support people like Slavic. Forgive me for my voice. About two days, something crumped caught my throat when we were in Maryland. I don't know what it was. I feel fine. I don't believe it's COVID. I feel healthy. I had a nice rest, but my, my throat is uh, still a little sore. But I'd like uh, Slavic to just share about his family. Uh, uh, first, what happened when he left um, Ukraine uh, very quickly, if you could share that. And then about Danik, about Daniel, what Daniel said. Yeah. Um uh, two weeks ago, I left from my home and come into the US, U.S. And uh, just uh, just uh, 15 minutes after I left from my home, um, six Russian f rockets fall down close to my house, just one one mile. And my wife was in home, and my children was in home. And I called to my wife and asked, "How how are you? How?" And she said, "I'm okay, but in stress, and my children in stress." Because you know it's so it's so loud, it's so it's scary actually. And um, but my son Daniel, he is my youngest son. He always says me one interesting thing. He said, "Daddy, you know, if Russian soldier fall down on our house, it's a good opportunity to see Jesus. So you don't need to be worried. We can see Jesus." So I said, yes, but we need to live. He said, yeah, daddy, I'm, I'm six. I'm ready to go to the Jesus. So it's interesting fact. My children don't fear about, about the rockets, about missiles, but this is our life now. So please pray about Ukraine. Thank you. And now I'd like to share from the Bible uh, just a short message. I appreciate uh, Kaz Church. I'm so grateful that you're helping Sergei Zhukovsky in uh, Belarus. He's doing well. He says hello to everybody. And uh, they are working on the facade now of the church. They need some funds. So I told them that I would share with you and then also other churches and families. Um, there's, uh, they never finished the facade, the Tyvek and then the stucco. So they have to do it this year. He needs about $5,000. And I said, we'll trust the Lord and uh, well, I'll get it over there to you before the winter, but start working on the church. I also bring greetings from Stepan Bandura and his son Vadim. Vadim says hello, and again he says thank you, thank you for helping him uh, with serving the Lord. Remember last year you gave the extra offering so that we can start helping Vadim, and now he doesn't have to do his roofing job as much. He's able to prepare his sermons. He's able to work uh, with the youth, with the Sunday school, with the outreach. And uh, hopefully next year, we will transfer all of the funds to Vadim. If his dad needs still a little bit of money, we may for one more year give him maybe 100 a month um, if he needs. And then the following year, Vadim will have the complete support. So thank you. Uh, for helping both in Belarus and Ukraine, and thank you for giving uh, Slavic this opportunity. You hear Slavic, you see he's there for a year and a half in this war, and you see how he is still optimistic. So pray for the Ukrainian people. They want to be op optimistic. They want to see victory. They, of course, want to win the war because they know if they lose... Not only will their country be well taken and a depression will come in, but we, you know when you give an evil man a little bit, you know what happens, right? They take more. And then after a year or so, they're going to take more. And so it's going to affect all of Europe. So let's pray that God would have mercy on Ukraine and that truly, like Slavic, we will also have this optimism that uh, they will be successful and they will still survive as a uh, country. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 
through 6. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered, a dried up hand. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, rise and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill and after looking around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began taking counsel with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Here we have a short story about Jesus teaching in the synagogue. It's also in the book of Luke, chapter 6, and the book of Matthew, chapter 12. So it's a very important story for us. I think you've heard this story before, but I hope I can give it a little bit of a different twist and share with you my opinions or what the Lord has shown me from this small, small story that doesn't seem to be very important. Yes, Jesus healed somebody. Amen. But listen, let's think about this story that we have here and that God will help us through the Holy Spirit to see just what God is trying to show us or teach us. Luke tells us that Jesus went into the synagogue to teach. Now, we know that these synagogues were like our churches today. The synagogue was created so that the Jewish people could come and learn about the Bible. They had the Old Testament. It wasn't in book form. It was in scrolls, yes? And so they had to open up these scrolls, and on the scroll, wherever they left off the next week, that's where they would begin. So they weren't able to go back and forth to different books if they were in the book of Isaiah they had to finish the book of Isaiah. After Isaiah, they had to do Jeremiah because it's the next book. If they were in Genesis, then they had to do after Genesis, Exodus, right? They had to follow the scroll. And so Jesus went there, and we know one time when he went in Luke chapter 4, they were in the book of Isaiah, yes? Yes. Providentially, that's exactly where Jesus wanted to explain to them what the Bible was teaching. So here he's teaching. Now think about the synagogue. The synagogue was not like this auditorium. They were a little different. And remember, this was not just five or ten people. There was a minimum of at least 30 or 40 people there. It might have been more. It might have been like the group here. It might have been about 100 people. But the auditorium was not facing all to the platform. There was a platform a little up, and usually the speaker or the leader sat on this platform or he stood. But the people, they were in uh, benches, or sometimes they brought their own stool, and they sat on this side in the back, and on this side. It was like the shape of a horseshoe, right? Or the book, uh, the pi sign in mathematics, right? That's how they stood. So that the, in the center, there was no people. Sometimes the platform went out, and the teacher was sitting there so that all of these people could see this person who's teaching. Now the leader of the synagogue, he would prepare the Torah or the, the scroll. And if there was a gifted man in the auditorium, if there was a gifted man in the synagogue, someone who was smart, who knew, he would invite him to come up. And that's what happened. They knew Jesus was smart, right? They said, where did he get this authority from? So, of course, when he went into the synagogue... 
they allowed him to come up freely to share God's word from the Old Testament. So you have the picture in your mind, right? People on this side, people in the back, and people on this side, Jesus either sitting or standing on a little platform teaching. Now, where were the Pharisees? It doesn't tell us. Maybe they were sitting with the people. Maybe they were standing in the back. We're not sure where they were, but they also were there. And it tells us they were ready to accuse Jesus. They were biting their tongue, just waiting to get back at Jesus. And it tells us, it's very interesting here, it tells us that there was a man with a dried up hand. How did the gospel writer know this? A disciple had to tell them, <laughs> or Jesus had to tell them through the Holy Spirit as they wrote. Now, some Bible teachers or Bible scholars say that the Pharisees told that man to come to the service, that he was a plant, that they planted him purposely in the service. I don't know if you have to go that far. It's not necessary for us to believe that. The Bible doesn't say that. It's possible that they told him to come, but it's not necessary. But he is in one of those rows. Do you think he's in the front row? He has a dried up hand. And in the Greek, it's not just this part of the hand. It's like the Ukrainian or Russian. When they say the word hand or arm, it's the whole. You have to specify if you're talking about just this part. The word means from here to here in the Greek language. So his arm is all dried up. And Luke tells us it's his right hand. And we know from the Bible, the right hand is the hand of power, right? Where's Jesus sitting right now? At the right hand of God. Because that's where power is. This is the working hand. Of course, some people are left and they work with their left hand. We all know that. That's an exception. But this is the working hand. This is the hand of power, and this poor man, it's all shriveled up. Do you think he wants everybody to see it? Do you think he wants everybody to notice him? No, I don't think he's on the front row. I don't think he's stand, sitting in the front near everyone. My view is probably he's in the back, <laughs> in the last seat, or the last stool. He wanted to come and hear, but he didn't want to be noticeable. So that's the picture. Do you see the picture? And these Pharisees in the book of Matthew, it tells us, they ask Jesus the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now for us, this is a very silly question. But for them, it was very serious because they had many, many rules from the Bible, they explained the doctrine and they had their tr traditions or their rules on top of the Bible. It was like a covering. It was like a lid. It hid the word of God. They had all these rules. And one of the rules is you could not work on the Sabbath. So healing is work. So you can't work. Isn't that baffling? That they wouldn't want somebody to be healed on God's day? But they said, no, you can't do any type of work. Wait till Saturday or, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But doesn't God work on Saturday also, the Sabbath? Doesn't God work on Sunday too? He does. It's very, very important for us to understand God works every day. He works in good times. He works in bad times. He works in peace. He works in war. And we are not to have traditions or rules that stop God from working. And that's what Jesus had to teach the Pharisees. Take that lid off of the container that has the word of God. Let the people see the word of God. Yes, it's okay to have your opinions. Yes, it's okay to have rules. 
But it's more important for people to see the word of God. And the rule should not hide or cover the word of God. So it's very important for us to see that that's why Jesus would do a lot of his miracles on the Sabbath. Because he, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. We know that, yes, from the scriptures. And so he says to them, on the Sabbath, is it better to do good or to do harm, do evil? You know the answer to that. It's, it's simple. It's very self-explanatory. Yes? Do good. Is it better to save a life, to rescue a life, or to harm a life, to let somebody die? You know the answer. Yes? Save a life. Rescue a life. And Matthew says that when an animal is in a pit, don't you allow the owner to go and take that animal out of the pit? Now, isn't a man more valuable than an animal? Well, with some people, you know, <laughs> their animal is more important than their friends sometimes, yes? It's sad, yes? But Jesus is trying to prove a point. On the Sabbath, on any day, brothers and sisters, do good. Even if you're having a bad day, even if there's problems, even if there's struggles in your family, even if work is not the best, you've got the Holy Spirit within you. Do good. Rescue a life if God gives you the opportunity because that's what Jesus did. What does the Bible say in verse 3? He said to the man with the dried up hand, get up, stand Stand up. Where was he? Stand up, you back there. Stand up and come forward. Come to the center. Come to the in, in the middle. What did the man say? No, I don't want to. I don't want anybody to look at me. Is that what it says? What did the man do? <coughs> he obeyed Jesus. Do you see the sign of faith? This man had to get out of his place. Stand up, everybody turned and looked at him, and he had to walk to the center. Everyone had to see him before Jesus. That is a sign of faith. Oh, I trust that all of you have come to Jesus. Stand and come in front of everybody. And then Mark is the only one that tells us what Jesus did in verse 5. Jesus looked around. He looked at those Pharisees because they wanted to kill him. He knew it. And how did he look at them? When he saw that sin, that sin of murder, that sin of anger, that sin of wanting to kill Jesus, he looked back at them in wrath. That's what that anger means. It's wrath, the word in the Greek. Because sin must be judged. He looked at them, and then his heart was grieved because he wanted them to come to his Father God. We are very upset when we see people sinning. And our day and age, you see what's happening. No God. No God in creation. We control the wind. We control the weather. No God in marriage between a man and a woman. It can be anybody. Love is love. They won't go back to the beginning. Who started it? Who created love? And now there's not even gender. You don't know if to say if somebody is a he or a she. Because God didn't create male and female. There could be other choices. No God. The fool had said in his heart, no God. Isn't it a shame? But we are angry but we're still grieved in our hearts. And we still want those people to come to Jesus. Because the Bible says in verse 5, Jesus said, not only stand, come to the center, but what did he say? Stretch out your hand. Stretch it out. I don't want people to look at my dried up hand. It's deformed. No, 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 he didn't do that. What did he do? 
Do you see the act of faith? He believed Jesus. He stretched out his hand. And what happened in front of everybody? I don't know how deformed it was, but do you get the picture? When he stretched it out, whether it was dried up, it, that's what the word in Greek means, dried up. Like a dried up piece of meat on a bone. And when he stretched it out, what happened? Do you see it, brothers and sisters? It is a fresh, new arm and hand. It's restored. And everybody saw that. Do you see why the Pharisees left immediately? What a miracle. Jesus wanted everybody to see that nice, fresh hand. Stretch it out. Reach to the heavens. And he did. He reached to the heavens. So what do I have to share with you? Why do I tell you this? Because somebody stood for us. Who stood up for us? Jesus, you know that, right? And what did he do? He stretched his hands. Just for you, just for me. He stretched his hands and he died on the cross. Now what are you doing? What are you doing in Buffalo? What are you doing for the circle around Buffalo? What are you doing for the world? Are you standing up for Jesus? Are you listening to him when he says to come? Come in the center. I want you to teach Sunday school. Come in the center. I want you to be part of the worship team. Come in the center. I want you to help the pastor. Come in the center. I want you to go on a missions trip. Are you stretching your hands? Are you seeing God work through your strand, hands? Or are you still dried up? You don't see God working in your life. You're still ashamed of Jesus. You don't know how to talk about Jesus. In the school, in the university, at work, somebody says something, and you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to just say something small about Jesus. Do you take that opportunity? Do you stretch your hand? Do you reach out to the world? That's what this story is teaching us. Because that man now has a hand of power. He's going back home, and if he has a wife and children, he can say to them, now I can work for you. I'm not an invalid anymore. I can work for you now. I can bring home the bacon. I can make some money. Because Jesus restored my hand. But he didn't just restore my hand. He restored my life. And I'm so glad that Jesus restored my life. That when he told me to stand and come to the center that I came, I came before him. And he told me to reach out to him, and I reached out to him. I trust that you've done that. Oh, if you haven't, brothers and sisters, young person, if you haven't, please reach out to Jesus. He will grab your hand. He will make you whole. He will clean you. He will save you. He will help you to do what's right. But you have to make the choice day by day. This man had to start living for Jesus. He had the faith to come and stand there. He had the faith to reach up his hand, but now he has to have the faith to live for Jesus, to work for Jesus, to honor and glorify Jesus. And that's what God wants us to do. Jesus is working. Every day he's working. Sometimes we don't see it. But now you see there's somebody in Ukraine that Jesus is working through that's trying to serve the Lord even when people are dying two or three hours from where he's working for God. They're dying. They're killing one another. And they're still trying to do children's camps they tried to do. They're still trying to help families in buying them washers or teapots, not just food and medicine, but they're trying to help them to live again. Because they can't hide in their basements. Isn't it amazing for a year and a half? What would you do every time you hear the sirens? You have to go down to your shelter. But do you stay there for 24-7? No, you have to come back out and you have to live. 
So what are you doing? Are you standing in your place here in Buffalo, New York? When Jesus wants you to do something, when he tells you to come forward, are you listening to the still voice? You know that small voice. It's not an audible voice, but you know when you do wrong. The hairs on your, your uh, arms start to rise. You turn red. You're embarrassed. You feel pressure on your chest or your, the back of your neck. That's the Holy Spirit teaching you, showing you you have to get right. Well, when he presses on your heart to do something for him, do you come forward? Oh, you have to. It's the best thing to do. What happened to this man? He was restored. And I pray that God will continue to help us here in Buffalo, in other states. You know it's not getting better in America. The Bible clearly tells us it's not going to get better. We have prophecy. We know what's going to happen. But until that time, we still have to serve God. We can't give up. We don't throw our hands up in despair. No, we stretch forth our hands with the power of God. And we ask God, please help me to reach somebody. Help me to stretch out my abilities. Whether it's just calling or texting somebody with a word of encouragement. Whether it's just going and helping somebody with groceries. Whether it's witnessing to somebody I work with or I go to school with. Stretch your hands. So when I leave, I just want you to remember those two words. Stand and stretch. If you want to do the R, rise and reach. That's what I want you to remember. Stand in your place. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. And stretch your hands for his honor and glory. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to thee, and as we bow our heads and our hearts, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much that he stood for us and that he stretched his arms for us. We thank you so much for the blood and how it has cleansed us from sin. And now as your children, even when we make mistakes, that blood can still keep us clean and help us to keep doing right. We're so glad, Lord, that we have your word. We're so glad that you explain and teach your word through great leaders. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to stand for you. Thank you so much for those people who are standing for you in Ukraine. I thank you for Slavic and his family. I thank you also for other families there. I thank you for families in Poland, in Belarus, in Moldova, in Czech Republic, in Hungary that are helping and trying to stretch their hands for these refugees. Oh, God, we want to be pleasing in your sight. And what little we can do, Lord, some of us, you know, we're not, a, we're not very educated. Some of us, we don't have a lot of gifts or abilities. But we know, Lord, that you can work through the great man, the powerful man, and you can also work through the weak or the small woman. We know, Lord, that you want to work in and through us. You've given us the Holy Spirit, so help us to stand in our place. Help us to come forward and then help us to reach the world for your son, Jesus. We love you. We trust you. And until your son, Jesus, comes for us, help us to be faithful. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.